So I thought my, you know, my title would draw everybody in. So that was good. Um, as Bob said, there was two projects that I started working on, and this has been they've both been highly, highly collaborative. Um, so this is just some of the people who have been directly involved with various components of it, um, from lots of different departments um, in lots of different universities. Um, and I spent a lot of time hassling managers at Queensland Parks and Wildlife and the Department of Parks and Wildlife, so uh, I'm thankful for their time with this. So as Bob mentioned, I know there's a lot about water, on water quality, and many of you have probably seen me talk a lot about sediment, but today I'm going to be talking about islands, and specifically these two projects that I've been working on for the last three years. I like to consider this my post-doc exit seminar. Um, but before I, I get into the islands, I kind of want to back up a little bit and talk about the real, so this project has really made me ask questions that I never thought I would ask. Um, it's been, you know, working on something that's totally different. Uh, so for instance, asking questions like, how many birds can you fit on an island? How did this cow pelvis land on this island? <laughs> Um, and can you train tiger sharks to patrol the borders of islands to keep goats from moving around? <laughs> and obviously, the answer is yes. Um, but I can back up a little bit and talk about the depressing year that we've had in terms of biodiversity. Um, so we all know about the coral bleaching that happened uh, around the world this year. There's also a huge mangrove dieback that happened down south. And there's been massive forest fires um, in Canada and the US. And all of this really has been you know, attributed to the effects of climate change. But a recent paper uh, that came out just a few weeks ago looked at sort of the, what's been killing uh, species so far. So this, they looked at um, over 8,000 species um, that were threatened or near threatened. Um, and you can see that so far climate change hasn't really um, resulted in that much air stress so far, I mean, still, you know, almost 2,000 species is a lot. But what you can see in the middle there is that um, invasive species have caused a lot of the damage um, to biodiversity that we've seen thus far. Invasive species come in lots of different shapes and sizes. Uh, they've invaded pretty much every single ecosystem um, in the world. And as soon as there's the opportunity to get there, um, they go crazy. This is a big problem now in Antarctica lots of um, ships going down there. And if you think just of Australia, I mean, we have camels, we have weeds, we have ants, we have goats, we have cats, we have foxes. Um, this is a big problem that caused a lot of issues. Okay. This is a map from a, a paper that came out a few years ago. This is just looking at cats on islands. And so this shows you how many species have been impacted by cats on islands around the world. Um, and you can see here the bars in the dark gray are actually the number of extinctions just caused by cats on islands. Um, islands are incredibly vulnerable to invasive species. One of the reasons for this is that islands have very high endemic richness. Um, this is a figure that shows uh, sort of endemism from plants, vertebrates, um, you know, it's broken down into different groups. And you can see the colors aren't so clear here. But you can see the dark pink um, is actually sort of where you have the highest level of endemism, and you can see that it overlaps with a lot of the islands around the world. Um, oh, okay. That didn't show up at all. Hmm. Okay, well, you can kind of see that there's a map of the world. This is North America. Um, unlike, you know, as Terry aptly put it, um, sometimes the effects of climate change make you want to weep. Uh, Invasive species and invasive species management actually offers a ray of hope in terms of the biodiversity crisis. So this is what I put this here because this shows you a little bit better. Um, for the, this is the amount of species populations that have recovered on islands due to invasive species eradication. So you can see that there's been hundreds of populations of species that have recovered thanks to um, invasive species eradication, which is a good thing, and it's a good thing to hope that we can do something uh, for biodiversity. Now, it hasn't always been smooth sailing. Uh, this, as this title from the New York Times ominously suggests, um, 
This is Macquarie Island, which is uh, very famous for this, this huge ratification project, which I'll tell you about. So in uh, this blurb, which I'm going to read to you, tells you a lot about why invasive species are an issue. So it says, by 1979, the rabbit population was at 150,000. They gave a mixed mitosis, um, and then the rabbit populations declined. Then they came in and they eradicated feral cats. Everything was good. The island was awarded World Heritage status. Um, but the rabbits sort of got over, became resistant to mixed mitosis. The, there were no predators on the island to uh, eat them anymore. And the rabbit population exploded to 130,000. So this tells us a few things about sort of one of the challenges of invasive species. For one, they are a legacy problem on a lot of islands. So the you know, species have arrived on islands basically as when ships started going to the Apps Islands, so sometimes they've been there for hundreds of years. Um, there's lots of different strategies that you can take. Um, you have to sort of have proactive management. You can't just make it a protected area and think that everything's going to be okay. Um, there's unexpected consequences when you start messing with the types of species that are on the island. So they initially went to eradicate cats off of Macquarie Island because the cats were feeding on this, the seabirds. It's an this island very important for seabirds. Um, once they removed the cats, the rabbits got so out of control and caused such bad erosion that they actually had these huge landslides. And very embarrassingly, they had this massive landslide that collapsed on the major seabird colonies. So there's some issues that are trying to work out. Um, and also, you can go in and, and put a lot of effort into management, but if you don't actually follow up on it, basically all of your management efforts can be undone. Um, so they embarked on this really massive um, invasive species eradication program on Macquarie. They brought in sniffer dogs to, to hunt them out. And then Macquarie Island was declared pest-free um, after seven years of the eradication program at the cost of $24 million. Um, so <laughs> this, is, this is just one island. Um, and so you can imagine then, if you think back to our islands here, um, in WA, uh, our private site area has 604 <coughs> islands. The Great Barrier Reef has 1,000 1, islands in it. Um, but this is a problem, and this is a conversation that the managers started having with Bob, and said, we have all of these invasive species. We have lots of different priority species that exist in different abundances on different islands. They're very expensive to eradicate, and we have very small budgets. Um, how do we possibly come up with a good way to make decisions? Because that's just thousands of decisions that you as a manager would have to weigh up in your head, um, which is almost nearly impossible for the human brain to do. And so Bob and the managers from WA and the Great Barrier Reef um, came up with these two projects. Um, so again, this is just a zoom in of um, the WA is between so the Exmouth Islands up to Port Hedland. And a thousand islands is a little bit ambitious, so we focused on uh, the two, 163 national park islands uh, down on the Southern Bay Barrier Reef. So, like I said, you have all these management challenges. You have goats, you have weeds, you have islands of different shapes and sizes. How do you make all of these different decisions? Um, you really need to prioritize, and you prioritize where your research Money, where your money is going to sort of achieve your conservation objectives. And the best way to do this is actually the decision support software. So the ultimate overriding goal of both of these projects is to develop a decision support software that optimizes your resource allocation to achieve your biggest conservation objectives. So you have a limited budget, where is the best place to get it to get the biggest conservation bang for your buck? Uh, so how do you have, go about doing this? Um, you need to do it with data. <laughs> and so the last three years, I've spent a lot of time coming up with how you actually figure out what to do, when to do it, et cetera. Um, so I'm just going to start first with the Southern Great Barrier Reef Islands. So we decided through uh, multiple meetings that we have 41 priority species on the islands. Um, you'll see I'm going to go through these sort of four different components of the project. Priority species, invasive species, your management actions, and the costs. So I started looking through the data, um, and actually there was a lot. There was over 31, almost 31,000 records of species on the islands. You can see the majority of them were native species, but there were also some uh, invasive animal and plants. 
And also the majority of the records were birds. But there was a few uh, amphibians. Um, you can see the tiny sliver of fungus. Uh, but yeah, so there's, there's a bit of a bias towards birds. And actually, when I started exploring the data even further, I realized that there were some issues. Um, there was a huge spatial bias, so 83% of the data was from the Capricorn Bunker and the Swains Group, which is in the southern Great Barrier Reef. Actually, 10% of all of the records were from Heron Island. Um, and there were 50 islands in our study region that didn't have a single record on them. There was also a huge temporal bias, so 65% of the data was from uh, before 1990. So, you know, if we're talking 25 years ago, is that data going to be relevant to um, sort of what's on the islands today? Uh, even the data that did exist was a little bit questionable at times. So this is just one example. This is from Heron Island. So in 1928, this guy said that black rat was common. And then there was a report from 1932 that said that the black rat was introduced to Heron Island in 1932. And so I don't know if it's a new invasion of rats, like what, you know, what's happening, but this kind of report was written in 1928, so surely there had been rats there at the time. But it didn't really matter because they said that rats were eradicated in the 60s. Great. And then the Department of Environment in 2010 says that there are rats on Heron Island. Um, thankfully, Heron Island is an island that people go to all the time. It's pretty easy to get that data. But a lot of these islands are quite remote, and so, you know, how do you, what records can you trust? Similarly, um, when you're trying to make a conservation impact, say you're saying, I want to remove an invasive species and I want to allow a priority species to recover, you need to know what the population was when the invasive species was there and what the population grows to once you remove the invasive species to be able to tell that you've actually had some kind of positive impact. So when you have a record like the hundreds, numbers of nadis have increased over the last week, which is one of the comments, this is the data point, that tells you nothing. Uh, similarly, there's comments like, the species was common. Again, it doesn't really tell you anything. Um, and these are my favorite. So in 1961, they recorded one seagull on Bird Rock, <laughs> and then they recorded the same seagull in 1971. So basically, useless. Um, so time for a little bit of audience participation. Jess, of the 31,000 records, how many of them do you think were relevant to our islands? Five thousand. Lisa? Uh, close. Um, 566. <laughs> <laughs> relevant. Um, that was not really going to suffice. You couldn't really do a lot of conservation with that. Uh, so I got into the experts. <laughs> I spent several months harassing experts um, using the, I elicited information from them about the population of species on the islands. And so I used something called the Delphi method, which is an established technique to elicit information. And after several months of doing this, I was able to then get um, sort of almost triple the amount of data that I had. But still, you have 163 islands, you have 41 priority species, there's still some, some data holes. Uh, so then we used the uh, regional ecosystem mapping that is in Queensland. So they've gone through and actually mapped all the vegetation types in all of Queensland and on all of the islands. Um, except for discovered beaches, because it turned out we kept saying that, why does this say that there are no turtles on the islands? Because the beach doesn't have vegetation, and so no one bothered to map it. <laughs> um, and we then related all of the priority species to vegetation type. So we could say, you know, if their vegetation is there, is that a suitable proxy um, in the absence of survey data? And so we were able to get then almost 3,000 data points. So just through these two different proxy techniques, we were able to go from 566 relevant records to 4,300. So that's now, you know, you're getting into data that's usable. But there was a bit of an issue. Um, so this is just, don't really pay attention to the numbers too much. What I want to point out is that not all sites and species were created equally. So we had some islands and species where we had habitat data and expert data. Some islands we only had survey data. Some islands we had survey data and expert data. Some islands, we had all three. And I didn't know how to, which data point was the most reliable. How do you actually then say, yes, you can, you know, you can assume that the 3,000 records that we have for habitat are correct and that you can make these um, sort of management recommendations based off of it. And in an ideal world, you would go out and resurvey all of the islands, but we couldn't do that. Um, and so uh, I developed these Bayesian belief networks. So Bayesian belief networks 
very quickly, um, use the Bayes theorem, which basically look at, in a nutshell, the probability that something is true given the evidence. So here's just a really simple example of it. So you have rain. So this is saying there's a 20% chance that, it, that it's raining, and there's an 80% chance that it's not raining. This says if it's not raining, there's a 40% chance that the sprinkler is going to turn on, and a 60% chance that it's not going to turn on. And then you combine them using Bayes' theorem, and then you can say, well, if the sprinkler is on and it's raining, there's a 99% chance that your grass is wet. It's a very simple math, but that's basically how it works. It sort of looks at um, compounding probabilities to try to get to what's correct. Um, and it's actually really hard for people to think about probabilities in their heads, so this is a really useful technique. So we looked at, um, we developed these Bayesian belief networks to look at what is the likelihood that a species is actually present given that the experts say it is or isn't present, given that the survey data says it's present, or given that the vegetation data says it, that it should be present. And what we found was when you looked at, you know, so that our species, you can see that there's not 41, because we didn't have enough data to look at all 41, even after all of that. Um, you can see that there's sort of varying degrees of reliability. So for some of the species, you know, eastern osprey, if the vegetation said it was there, um, if the vegetation was present, there's sort of a 73% chance that the species was there, whereas the experts were much better at identifying it. Um, on the other hand, you have the less aggressive turn, and the vegetation said, you know, 89% chance, and the experts didn't do so well. Um, and then I wanted to know what happened if you had both of the different data types. So you can't go out and survey, but, you know, it, it was relatively easy to get access to sort of the experts' knowledge through this technique, and we had a lot of data on the habitat. And so could you use both of these as uh, sort of reliable proxies? And we turned out that for most of the species, um, you actually could. I mean, when you had both the experts saying it was there and the vegetation was there, you know, you were up in sort of for the majority of the species above 90% chance that it was there, which is really great because then you can actually say to the experts, this is reliable data, you can sort of trust that this data is telling you the correct things. And it also shows us when things performed really badly, so for the crested turn, there's only 49% chance that it's going to be there, or 62% chance. So if they were going out to resurvey, these are the species that they should probably focus on surveying, because they actually needed to survey them. So that was just step one <laughs> of, this, of this process. Um, and at the time, we were also looking um, at sort of eliciting information about the invasive species. But what we really needed to know was what the invasive species were doing to our priority species. So imagine for a moment, my data for your graph, um, you've got time on the x-axis and you have abundance on the y-axis. So we're back on Macquarie Island, you have cats are in the red, rabbits are in the yellow. You come along, you eradicate the cats. And in, you know, for most of us, you took some kind of like population dynamics in your general ecology class, possibly, the rabbits rebounded um, in the sort of logistic growth curve. And so we basically modeled this for 190 species on the island. So we looked at your species abundance, which was driven by your intrinsic growth rate. So, you know, what, how fecund are you? What kind of food availability is there? Uh, et cetera. And then also your predation. So for the species in the island, we had two different kinds of species. We had space limited species, which were your seabirds and your turtles and your plants, which needed the islands for shelter and for nesting, but actually didn't depend on the island for any nutrition, uh, which made it complicated because you can't actually, sometimes the seabird populations were driven by things totally unrelated to the island, <coughs> more to do with fish, but we couldn't model that. So we just said, okay, well, what do we know is going to be happening on the island? And so we looked then at the competitive interaction of all the different species. We looked at um, what habitat was there, what other species liked that habitat, um, to try to get a sense of you know, how many we could have on an island. And then there's also the consumer species, or things that actually were eating things that were growing on the island. And these models worked in tandem. So um, if the carnivores were eating seabirds and there was not enough space for the seabird and its population couldn't grow, and that was also controlling the carnivorous population. Um, and then there was also this predation. So we have our, our cats are gone, our rabbits have gone crazy, 
And the line is pink, in pink is a vegetation, so we know that the graphics got involved with vegetation. So we basically modeled this, these predation events. Um, so we looked at, for all of the 190 species, how they interacted with each other, so you could get a sense of you know, what would happen if uh, an invasive rat was on the island, but um, also then what would happen if you removed an invasive rat, how would other trees grow? Um, we're also really interested in then your management. So we're coming along, you know, and we're saying, okay, you should remove an invasive species on an island. We need to know what's going to happen. And so we modeled then the effectiveness of all of our management actions. So we said, you know, the removal of cats could be 100% effective, um, and that's and it's going to take a certain amount of time. And so this is what we expect is going to happen once you um, undertake your management action. So then what we could say for all 190 species is that the first scenario is you don't do anything. You say, we are not prioritizing this island, and the invasive species is going to be, remain on that island. What's going to happen? And the second scenario is, OK, you come along, you do an action, and the invasive species is going to rebound. And that way, you could then link what when you were prioritizing and you were deciding to undertake a management action or to not undertake a management action, what was going to be the ecological consequence of the different management actions. And the other thing that they allowed us to look at was um, the timing. So we have this you know, S-shaped curve, but you know, some things like bunnies, <laughs> where you like rabbits, where the population is explode very quickly, and there's other things like goats, which take a lot longer to build up. And so that can allow you to say, if we, you know, we can't go to kill rabbits until year three, this is what's going to happen. But maybe we're going to get more money out of it, you know, if we kill rabbits at year one, because they're going to cause um, a lot of destruction in those three years. So we could also then start looking at the temporal dynamics of when you actually go and implement management actions. So now we have, you know, we know how things are interacting, um, and I've alluded to it, but we actually have to go and figure out, well, how do you actually kill invasive species. Um, they, there is more than one way to skin a cat, I found it out. Um, invasive species on our islands come in all shapes and sizes. We have goats, we have rats, we have cats, we have bubble grass, we have cacti, and each one of them has a different requirement in terms of how you kill it. Um, and you would be forgiven for reading the titles of these papers and assuming that someone had already worked all this stuff out. Uh, but actually, they hadn't. When you look at these, you can see that someone says, okay, well, um, action A is 90% effective, and action B is 80% effective. But I really wanted to know why, what the ac particular actions were that you were doing. Because to, in order, once you worked out what the particular actions were, you could come up with a reliable cost estimate. So you could really say it's going to cost this amount of money to achieve this conservation objective. And so I spent a lot of time uh, looking at different management protocols. Um, and it turned out that most management <laughs> actions didn't actually have any protocols. So I spent a lot of time, for instance, working, uh, calling up chemical manufacturers to figure out what their requirements were to kill a weed on an island. Because there was nothing in the literature, and the managers didn't have any reports about the concentrations that they were using. But I found out chemical manufacturers were legally required to work out these things before they could sell them. Um, and so I broke all of the management actions into different components. So I realized you say, okay, we're going to do a rat eradication, but actually that was broken down into lots of different sort of sub actions, if you will. So you would go and do a field trip before you started your eradication program just to figure out where the rats were on the island. Then you would have some time in the office planning the eradication. You would go out and do the eradication which happens, you know, a few times a year, and then there would be follow-up activity. And so for each of those different sub-actions, I costed out the travel component, the labor component, the consumables, the, the chemicals that we were using, and the equipment that we were using. And that allowed me to look at, you know, how much we're spending on each of these. And this ultimately could help us answer questions such as, is it cheaper to go out maybe and survey and treat three islands that are right next to each other because your travel component is the most expensive part. And so, you know, you're traveling to three islands, it's going to be cheaper because you don't have to pay that travel cost. Um, and then I worked out how many times of year you needed to go. 
um, how many times during the year you need to go, and then how many years that you have to actually undertake all these actions. And at the end of all of this, I was able to work out then how much it was going to cost per action um, and how that money was being spent. And this was a lot of work. <laughs> and I didn't realize, I, I hadn't actually read any of the cost literature until after I'd done all of this, because I just said, I'm going to go about making a budget, right? Like, it, that's what I seemed to be doing. And then I realized that there were all these assumptions that people made about costs that would have been way easier and it would have saved me so much time. Um, and so then I thought, well, I'm going to test some of those assumptions to see whether or not you can actually use them um, and still get away with coming up with sensible solutions. Uh, so one of, there was a few assumptions that I tested, but one of the assumptions that was that management costs scale with area. Um, so it didn't matter, it was just a planar area of what you were treating which meant, in a way, that terrain shouldn't matter because if you're looking at a map and you said, oh, that's five hectares, and that five hectares is the same as that five hectares, so they should, be, they should cost the same. Uh, so I tested that with our cost estimates. So this is, so there's three lines on this graph. So we've got the size of a weed infestation in hectares on the x-axis, and I have the cost in a billion dollars. Um, that the, co the highest cost is $4 million. Um, so we're talking about large sums of money here. Um, the red line is looking at the estimated costs just based on area. The light blue line of Island A is looking at using our cost estimates, but assuming that we're on a flat island. And Island B is using our cost estimates, but assuming that we're on a rugged island. And so, The first thing you can see here is that even though the line is a bit bumpy, it does sort of go in a linear fashion. And so you might say, oh, well, okay, so a linear, you know, assuming area uh, is a good proxy for cost might be a, a good way to go. But in theory, right, so we're still talking about the fact that managers need to spend their money and actually go and do things on the island. And so when I looked at the differences in these costs, so just on, on a flat island, um, you, the cost estimates, there was you know, $220,000 difference between the flat island using comprehensive costs and a straight line. Uh, that difference was even more severe when you actually started considering islands that were gonna have different you know, levels of ruggedness. So this, we're now talking about a difference of $1.2 million. Um, and even then between the rugged island and the estimated cost of $950,000. So even though the R squared on these lines is quite good, if you underestimated your eradication program by $950,000, you have a huge risk of failing, and basically all of that money would have been for naught. Um, and alternatively, you can see here that sometimes the island A costs are lower than anticipated. And again, even if you underestimate what something's gonna cost and you've allocated all of your funding towards a particular project, you may have missed out on your ability to do something else on an island because your, your estimates were inaccurate. Um, so this sort of really highlighted to me that the time spent doing this and trying to work out a defensible system to say, okay, this is how it's broken down, um, can actually lead you to much better estimates. Um, and so then you, I know then that it's much easier to then link, like how my money is being spent what action is being spent on, how that action is going to affect invasive species, and how ultimately that will affect my priority um, So I've mostly been talking about uh, things that are already on the islands and have already invaded, but for any and all of you who have flown into Australia, you know that uh, there's a huge list of things that you're not supposed to bring in, this is your uh, customs sheet, um, because Australia is very concerned about biosecurity, in part because they have a really poor record of biosecurity, and they're trying to kind of make up for it. And so, some of, you know, there are things that are already on islands, but what are, there are also management actions that you can take to make sure that things don't get uh, to islands, so your biosecurity protocols. So you could do quarantine, you could go out and have routine surveillance to try to pick up new arrivals, which are much cheaper to treat than a full-blown invasion. Um, and then, you know, at the last resort, you know, you control something if it's already gone to the island. Um, and so, you also need to 
be able to prioritize those different actions. So I get back to my old friend, Basin, the Leaf Network, and I wanted to model the spread of invasive weeds throughout all of the 604 islands in WA. And so we looked at the um, pathways that the weeds disperse via. So they disperse by recreational activity, industrial activity, uh, water dispersal for current and floods, and wind dispersal. So our first model was recreational activity. Um, and we realized very quickly that this was gonna be a little bit more complicated than our really simple for new phasing model that we initially developed. Um, so first we needed to figure out, okay, well, why were people visiting islands? You know, what made an island attractive? We looked at the um, coral reef mapping to see, you know, an island that had coral reef people would probably go to. We looked at uh, nearby fishing. We looked at whether or not there was good sheltered bays that yachts would go to. We looked at the boat, the recreational boat ownership in the region to try to figure out how many people were likely to visit the island every year. Just to figure out wh which islands were desirable and weren't desirable. And then we looked at, you know, the sort of attachment rate. So if you are camping, um, you will probably notice if there's a big chunk of cactus sticking on your leg, <laughs> then you would walk back to the won't you would probably just avoid camping near cactus. Um, whereas with something like buffalo grass, which have tiny little seeds, they can get caught in your shoes, you probably would camp near it anyways, and so there's a much higher chance that you're going to bring buffalo grass to an island as a visitor than you would um, a piece of prickly pear. And then we looked at industrial activity. So we looked at the islands that had industry or they had some kind of infrastructure. So some of the islands have lighthouses or communication towers. And we looked at the phase of the industry um, in terms of the amount of people that you'd expect with each phase of industry. And we looked at whether or not people were bringing machinery over, because obviously if you bring machinery over, things can get stuck in tires. And then we started getting into sort of our more natural dispersal mechanisms. And we had to then look at well, how and where do these things go. So first we worked out how for the water dispersal, how long seeds can survive in salt water which is not, was more challenging to find than I anticipated. Um, and then we wanted to, we needed to work out where the things were gonna go. And so thankfully, the CSIRO has developed a current dispersal model that they use for the marine connectivity. And so we used that to drop the crop fuel um, into the water by every single island that had the weeds currently present and along the mainland. And we saw, when we ran the model for the amount of days that the weed could survive in the water to see which islands it was going to be likely to get to. And similarly for the flood plumes, we mapped flood plumes for the last 10 years. We looked at the amount of rainfall events that caused the flood plume, and we looked at any of those events, the flooding events, which islands were likely to get floods, so we could work out how far the, the weeds were likely to go. Uh, and finally, wind. We had to work out the speed of the wind uh, in the area, the speed uh, the distance that weeds could travel with different types of wind speed, and then we needed to work out whether or not the wind was going in the right direction. And so I calculated the bearing of every island to every other island and worked out how often the wind was blowing in different directions to work out the probability that the wind was blowing in the right direction from an island that had a weed to an island that didn't have a weed, um, and to work out what was potentially going to be arriving. And all of these models also then incorporated uh, this habitat mapping that we've done in the area, so we could see um, where, if a weed arrived to the island, would it even be a suitable habitat that the weed could survive on? And so all of these four different models went into an establishment model. The establishment model looked at things like, you know, is there infrastructure or disturbance available on the island? Because that can sort of increase the chances that a weed is going to establish if it was the right habitat. Um, and then how many proper girls do you need to arrive before there's the likelihood that something will establish. So I ran this model for five years uh, dynamically, so after every year I would see where things have gotten to, and then I would reallocate the presence of weeds, and then I'd run it again, see after five years where the weeds have established. But then I was also really interested to know Okay, well, what happens if you take out human dispersal? 
I mean, these things we've now allowed them to cross final geographic barriers, but a lot of these things have, you know, dispersal mechanisms. And so, in the absence of humans, where would the weeds go to anyway? I mean, for a windblown species, you might say, and this is the, what the managers sort of talk about, is they say, oh, well, it's useless to do anything about buffalo grass because it's going to be on all the islands, and I wanted to test that theory. Um, so I assumed that there was no human dispersal, and I modeled where things were going to get to just with uh, natural dispersal. So this is the, the different weed species that we used um, and the number of islands where you have no establishment. So even with human dispersal and uh, natural dispersal, we, you weren't going to get anything. And you can see with this, with some of the weed, there were hundreds of islands that weren't ever going to get this weed, um, which is great because now you can say, okay, well, for one, we can sort of don't have to worry about necessarily doing that much surveillance on those islands because it's very unlikely that things are going to get there. Um, and it also then allows you to sort of better understand um, what species are maybe getting more being at risk. And then I wanted to know, like I said, where things were getting to just through human movement. Um, and it was low, um, but you can see again, like for some of these islands, um, you know, for buffalo grass now, instead of thinking it's hopeless, there's 604 islands that are going to get buffalo grass. Actually, um, there's 75 islands that are only going to get buffalo grass because of humans. And so now all of a sudden, if you're targeting surveillance and quarantine programs, you've moved your range from 604 to 75. So this information really allows managers to then um, have a much better understanding of the actual risk of these things in their system. And so, as I said in the beginning, we developed this decision support tool that can look at all of these um, different components. And so, these are some screenshots of it. So now, you can load up all of your data and you can look at, sort of explore, to see where things are. Um, for instance, here you can see, you know, we're on Barrow Island, those are the populations of all the species, those are the introduced species, those are the native species. And then you can, say, okay, well, how long do I want this to run? Say I have a, you know, a million dollar budget um, that I can spend over five years. And the software will then say, this is what we suggest that you should do, these are the actions that we suggest, these are the islands that we suggest, and this is when in those five years that you should do those actions so that you can actually achieve your conservation objectives. And um, we showcased the software to the managers in WA in March, and we had them, we put it on their computer and we had them playing around with it. And one of the sort of senior managers who's sort of retired, um, and he's been doing a lot of invasive species management, pointed to an island, he's like, that cost estimate is way off. It's not gonna cost that much. And I was like, all right, well, like, we'll open it up. And so we opened it up and had everything broken down because of labor, trans, you know, transport, consumables. And when we started talking through it, he started doing his mental math of how much those things should cost, and, and the sort of looking at how the model had done it, because he could see how everything was being spent. He actually was like, no, I, I correct, like I stand corrected, your estimates are actually sort of what I would have envisioned, now that he could see it. And it was a really good sort of, I guess, test to see like, yes, we've actually done this more or less correctly. And you know, it was the ability, I think some, you know, for managers who've been doing this for years, um, and sort of working with a complicated software it can sometimes be it's challenging if you can't, they can't really sort of query it and see why the software is making decisions. But the fact that you could then open it up and see why we were making the recommendations that um, we were sort of really uh, enabled them to actually have confidence um, in the software. So uh, with that, I'm going to leave you with uh, this picture of someone riding a turtle. So I mean, <laughs> even though things can sometimes feel depressing in conservation, uh, at least we don't let people ride turtles anymore in Harry, so that's <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs>